Hello, and welcome to Gold Coal Starts Virtual Cinema Series. My name is Regina Gill. I'm the founder and executive director of Gold Coast Arts, and I'll be your host today for what will be a fascinating interview with a very, very interesting filmmaker. Joining us from England today is our special guest, Phil Grabsky, director of Leonardo, The Works. Phil is a filmmaker who has won multiple awards for his directing, writing, producing, and cinematography. In 2009, Phil and his colleagues began work on a new arts genre for the cinema called Exhibition on Screen. This brings major art exhibitions and the stories of both the galleries and the artists to cinema. TV, DVD audiences worldwide are benefiting from the work that they've done. He and his company, Seventh Art Productions, are behind cinema films such as Muhammad Ali, Through the Eyes of the World, In Search of Beethoven, and In Search of Mozart, as well as six enormously popular history films hosted by Monty Python's Terry Jones. Seventh Art is noted as being the world's biggest producer of arts films for cinema and TV over the last 20 years. Phil has also written four history books, he lectures and gives master classes, and is regularly involved as a judge for the Emmys, BAFTA, Grierson, and One World Awards. He has won numerous personal awards himself, including Royal Television Society uh, awards for both Best Director and Services to Television, and a Voice of the Listener and Viewer Award for Services to Education. Just as a side note, Phil was born in New York, uh, but left at the age of one, our loss. So before I go any further, let me introduce to you the director and filmmaker, Phil Grabsky. And hello, Phil, how are you? Very well, thank you. Your goal in making this film about Leonardo, was it to speak about him to a new audience of people who may not have known much about him or to, in addition, to find, um, to dig deeper and to find things for people who thought they knew everything there was to know about him? Well, I've been making films for 35 years and sometimes, uh, and, and a lot of that has actually been biographies, uh, biographies of great commanders, mm. um, biographies of Roman, you know, when I, when I had a commission from the BBC and A&E to make a series about the rise and fall of the Roman Empire. And the way that I did it was I looked at six individuals, six leaders, Caesar, Julius Caesar, and then five emperors. Um, and it's interesting when you say to somebody, oh, I'm making a film about Monet or Muhammad Ali or Julius Caesar, people's response sometimes will be, oh, I know about him. And then you ask, well, what do you know? Exactly. And I, I personally think that we are all intelligent, sentient beings, but frequently highly uninformed. And part of that reason is because there's just so much. And maybe our parents didn't encourage us to read books or that it wasn't part of the school curriculum or it hasn't been on television. I've done a lot of work for television. I think television is responsible for a lot of, um, uh, it could have done a lot more to educate people worldwide. So we, even with someone like Leonardo, I, I doubt there's anyone who's not heard the name, but I think if I was to sit down with them and say, okay, what do you know? Tell me when he was born. Tell me another painting apart from the Mona Lisa, et cetera, et cetera. People actually don't know a great deal. Well, I, I made a film about Mozart. One of my favorite films it took me three years. I absolutely loved it. Um, and one of the letters that Mozart writes to his father at one point, I'm very lucky because there's over 800 letters survived. That's where you start as a filmmaker, the letters. He writes a letter to his father and he says, I've just written this new piece of music and like all my works, I've written it for two audiences. The audience that will really appreciate the complexities of what I do and then the rest who will whistle the melody on their way to work. Um, and I think that's kind of true with, with whenever I approach a film, 
there's, a, there's always going to be a little bit of the melody, like Impressionist paintings, the things that you immediately get from the Impressionist painting. You understand the story, the colours are very vibrant. But then when you start looking more deeply, you see all these extra layers. And what makes these artists great is that they are multi-layered, they are multi-textured. They're, they're extraordinary storytellers. Uh, you ask why Leonardo? Well, so first of all, I think there's always reasons to make a film about someone, even if there have been other films, because people may have missed it, or sometimes those other films are a bit superficial. The other thing is that it's, it's, it's to do with the history of exhibition on screen. So I was making a, we actually had become the world's biggest independent producer of television and arts programs. Right. It's quite a small group. And even in the United Kingdom, it was a constant struggle. Um, not as bad as the United States, but pretty bad here too. And I, because of technology, and because of a frustration with broadcast, I realized about 11 years ago that there was a new area that I could explore with art films, which was the cinema. No longer did I have to distribute on film. And to distribute one film was usually five film tins, very heavy, big like this, very expensive. No. Um, and to have a nation, a national release of a film on the film was beyond our budget. It was more than we'd spent on the film. Um, plus, at that time, it's only 10 years ago, but cinemas were not really willing or, you know, they were used to the, the blockbuster films, the name films. But something significant happened not far from where you're sitting, in New York, Manhattan, the Met, in about 2007, eight, started doing live opera. They were able to take advantage of technology, which meant that they could film it live, beam, up, beam it up to a satellite, and then via a network of seven satellites, anywhere, I, I could watch it if I had permission, but any, any cinema could watch it anywhere in the world. This was the beginning of something known as event cinema. It was an event. And they would shoot it on a Saturday afternoon. So it'd be seven o'clock, 2, 2 p.m. in New York, seven o'clock in London, eight o'clock in Paris, People would dress up to go to their cinema to watch a live opera from New York. Then the National Theatre in London started. I was making a film about a play called War Horse when they did, at the same time in the same building, they were doing their first NT Live. They were doing a play called Fedra. I'd never heard of it, but they had Helen Mirren. That was their key. And they thought, we'll try it once and see how it goes. Well, with Helen Mirren, it went very well. I'm sure. That's now extremely successful. Then the Royal Opera House, then the Scala, then the, all sorts of people tried. They tried it with the uh, Pennsylvania, it's called the Pennsylvania Symphony Orchestra and the Los Angeles Symphony Orchestra. Classical music hasn't really worked, but certainly opera, ballet, theater have worked. And I thought, I'm going to try this with a big exhibition. We've been filming big exhibitions for the television, and I'm going to try it for the cinema. No cinemas were interested. In the end, well, I should say that I went to the National Gallery in London, who I knew very well, and I said, I want to do, I want to do your next big exhibition. This is 2009. And they said, well, you're in luck, because in 2011, we will be doing the biggest Leonardo exhibition ever. So I thought, okay, that's the one. And it did take two years to organize. It, was, it took a long time to get the permissions, all sorts of technical complications, because we had to, the only way I could get one cinema chain in the United Kingdom to show it was if we did it live, live on opening night from the National Gallery, because they thought that event cinema had to be live. The only reason that you would come, you, the audience, would come to a film is if it was live. And I said, look, arts are different. It, you're not, you don't go to a gallery to be in a, a, an audience like the theater or opera. Actually, what you want is the privilege of seeing something up close with as few people around you as possible, except maybe a curator or an art historian or an artist. No, 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 it has to be live on opening night. All sorts of problems. National Gallery said, you cannot film anyone that has a glass of champagne. We don't want to be seen drinking champagne on a, I mean, <laughs> um, all sorts of things like that. But we did it. 
And it was in 42 cinemas in the United Kingdom. 41 of them turned people away. They had people, they, they sat them everywhere. They sat them in the ushers' seats. They sat them in the disabled seats if there was nobody there. And they turned people away. And the cinemas thought, this is interesting, this works. So that was the beginning of Exhibition on Screen, 2011. I was a bit frustrated though, because the, the nature of shooting something live in an, in an exhibition inhibits you as a filmmaker. What somebody says in the moment, it's said. You can't go back and ask them another question. You've got those 45 seconds with somebody. The, we had two presenters and they got a bit excited and started speaking too quickly. Um, your, the, the way you film things isn't quite right. The, the, the speed, of, so, although I recut the film subsequently before releasing it internationally, including the United States, um, I always wanted to come back to Leonardo. Now, the other thing about Leonardo is that when one looks into Leonardo, there was never any real sense of how many paintings did he do. Now, I've made films, we, we, we've just finished our 25th exhibition on screen, and some of those artists have painted two, 3,000 paintings. I made a film about Picasso where people talk about 50,000 artworks. Or more. Or more. So with, with Leonardo, you have the possibility, some, some people say he did 16 paintings, 15 paintings. It's not very many. But there was always this lack of definitive number. Even Vermeer, people are fairly clear, 35, some say 36. But So I thought, I'm going to make in a sense, the, the, the best exhibition that you could ever go to. And in doing so, I'm going to decide with, with lots of advice, exactly how many paintings did he do? And that's what we did. And that, so for example, the very famous Salvatore Mundi, undoubtedly- I'm going to ask you about that, which is in a private collection. It, it's, it's definitely, in a, it's in a very private collection. <laughs> Nobody knows where it is. Well, I didn't um, think you were going to tell us, but I was hoping. <laughs> well, $450 million, the most expensive painting ever bought at auction. That's right. Bought by a Saudi prince or a couple of, couple of let's say a Saudi prince. It was supposed to have gone on show uh, in Abu Dhabi in their beautiful museum there, art gallery. Uh, and then to their embarrassment, it, it didn't. And since then, no one's really sure where it is. The likelihood is it is in a vault in, in Switzerland. Why wasn't it shown? Well, there's been various theories about the fact that maybe they suddenly realized it's Jesus Christ and this is an Islamic, that's nonsense. Um, maybe they felt that it wasn't a Leonardo and they'd been ripped off. Uh, possibly, but I think it, it is, it, it was a damaged, I mean, it was, it's, it's been um, repaired, but it's still, I think, you know, it's a Leonardo. The most likely is that Saudi Arabia, certainly pre-COVID, was trying to open up and is spending a fortune on the arts, which is, which is a good thing. And they are in the process of building a, a, a big art gallery themselves. And I think the most likely explanation is that they are holding it back to have in that gallery in Riyadh. We'll see. An interesting theory. So in short, the objective was to show every painting um, and to show it in as much detail as possible. One thing to add is that last year was a, a, an anniversary, a 500th anniversary. Actually, anniversaries are completely irrelevant. I mean, what, what difference does it make, whether it's the 499th or the 500th? But, and there were one or two other films that were rushed out to hit the anniversary. I think I was a bit smarter than that because what I did was I waited because a number of paintings were given, rest, were restored for the anniversary. And I waited that I could get access to, to see these newly cleaned, newly analyzed paintings, which is why mine came at the end of the year. Um, and also one of the things about exhibition on screen is we kind of take our time. 
sometimes to get access to a painting takes time. Private collectors are very reluctant sometimes to allow you to have access. Well, that was one of my questions. How, how you had so many scholars and so many uh, speakers, um, each of whom had an interesting perspective and an interesting thing to say, and from different cities and different places and different institutions or universities and galleries. Uh, first of all, how did you arrive at those doorsteps? And second of all, um, how difficult was it for you to get the permissions that you're talking about to go see the works themselves? We've always tried to make it clear that exhibition on screen is not just a walkthrough of an exhibition. And in this case, there was no exhibition. If you like, I'm the curator. That's right. But, but we're trying to make something that works in the cinema. We're trying, we're trying to make cinema films. Now, cinema has to have a narrative. It has to be entertaining. It has to be dramatic. It has to have a good score. You can't and just... A good story. And a good script. Good story. Actually, every single film, the most important thing is the narrative. That's right. Without a question of a doubt. Um, you also run the risk that it can just be two dimensional paintings, particularly, you know, with an, when we're looking at just the paintings primarily of Leonardo. So the first thing that I decided was that I wanted, which I don't always do, but I wanted in this case to show you the location. It's a breath of fresh air. All of a sudden you're in St. Petersburg or you're in Florence or you're in Edinburgh. Or Krakow. It's also Krakow. It's also interesting just to get a sense of where these paintings have ended up and the way the reverence with which they're held. There's that kind of subtext there. But then the idea, the, the intention, well, then what I did was I tried to find the expert within the institution who could comment upon the painting. And um, in almost all cases, they only talk about their own painting. Um, and again, that gives you a variety of, of, uh, of comment. Um, then we had you know, two or three other people who pop up throughout the film. Martin Kemp is you know, world, a leading world uh, authority. Um, and it was quite plausible that he wouldn't appear. I mean, these, these, I know, I've, I've, got, I've got to know him now. He is approached practically every day. Practically every week, certainly every month, he's approached with a new Leonardo. Um, he can barely talk about Leonardo without somebody saying, you know, criticizing him or commenting upon it. I mean, it's, it's endless for him. And he's very, very busy. And so when a filmmaker comes along, his, his, immediate, his first reaction is, I just don't have time. So, you know, I, have to, I send him examples of our work and I explain to him the intention. And once you get talking, now that we've met and he's seen the finished film and he's, he's done some Q and A's with me on stage and, you know, he's, he, he, he would be, we were going to do uh, um, some literary festivals together where he talks about his book, I talk about a film. But that was important to get him. With the other places, you just have to go through it step by step. Russia is extremely complicated and expensive to get into, just the visa process. Um, but we've worked with St. Petersburg before, and there's a, a, a local crew there that I've worked with before. That's actually very straightforward. Once you get in, um, Italy's difficult. Um, I, uh, I once had a meeting at the Uffizi where I was talking to them about making a film about the Uffizi and I was talking to them about we're in 67 countries and it'd be great marketing for them and, and they laughed. The guy I was talking to laughed in my face. He said, we don't want any more visitors. I can imagine. So he said, I don't, I don't need any marketing. <laughs> um, and it, and it's, it's interesting now with the implications of COVID I'm already hearing from galleries that in, in some senses they feel that reducing down to 20% visitors has certainly improved the quality of the experience for the visitor and the quality of the, of, of the work environment for the employees. The issue is the drop in finance. But, um, well, that's a question I have for you, actually. Um, in 1969, I, I was, uh, I was, just out of school and I was traveling Europe and I had the pleasure of seeing, getting to see the pieces that I wanted to see 
without the crowds and without, for example, the Mona Lisa beh behind glass or anything like that. And, and I took it no, for granted. There's no way you're traveling Europe in 1969, oh, 1979. <laughs> thank you, but no, 69. Wow, I'm surprised. Thank you, um, but yes. And um, now you've got me all flustered. <laughs> so, so, but the point I was actually getting to was that there weren't there weren't the same kinds of crowds. People yeah. really, it was a much more. Um, you had to be actually interested in in art and interested in that particular period and, and Leonardo himself. And there was no glass. There was yeah. no there was no need. So you've had the opportunity now to see these in that same, even more intimate way. And I think one of your people, was it Martin Kemp? Somebody spoke about having the opportunity of seeing, I think it was the Mona Lisa, unframed. And yeah, it, was, it, it wasn't Martin, but he talks about seeing the Mona Lisa unframed. And, and right. he really the colors. And he was absolutely dazzled. I mean, there's, there's a couple of things there. First of all, technology has advanced so much that the quality that we can now film uh, is, I mean, it doesn't need to get any better. You know, there are, fact, there are designers in Japan and Germany and Korea telling us we now need what's called 8K and 10K and don't. The quality of these films in the cinema now is as good as they need to be. And it's quite extraordinary to see this in close up. Um, it's a very interesting issue that these galleries had and there were actually meetings between major galleries. What do we do with the amount of tourists that we're getting? And in particular, there was a, there is, um, but there was a rapidly expanding Asian middle class that was now traveling to Europe and was going to galleries. Right. And they would go to specific, they, I'm being a bit generalist here, but there were specific paintings that were very popular. Um, and this, this was a real issue because the, the institutions were overwhelmed. There was like, you know, you'd queue for an hour to see the Mona Lisa and then you'd only have a few minutes to see it. Now, who are we to say, I oh, know I'm sorry, but uh, you know, people from the East, we, we have to stop you. We can only allow West, I mean, you can't do that. No, um, as a matter of the we've discovered that they have tremendous reverence for, for the classical arts um, of Western civilization. Yeah. Many times more, more so than our own students and our own, um, our own population. Absolutely, and, and um, it's, it's, it's fantastic. I, I do a lot of traveling, well, I did do a lot of traveling with, with the films, and it's great to go to somewhere like Dubai or <laughs> Why not? places where, there's this real in interest in the arts. Um, and that's a very powerful thing. And I think that the more this can be encouraged in places like Iran or Saudi Arabia, Israel, wherever you, the better it is because of, because of what art communicates, which we could talk about. Um, but of course, what you're also finding now is that people are finding the galleries are just too busy. And Again, that's where these films can offer an alternative way of, of, of seeing the art. You will never get to see all these paintings in person. It's not possible. Maybe, maybe Martin Kemp is the only person on this planet that's seen all these paintings up close. No one else would be able to. If you're in Krakow, you would be mad not to go and see Lady with Irma. Lady with Irma. Um, I wouldn't go to the Louvre to see the Mona Lisa, but I would go to the Louvre to see the, the, the other Leonardo's they have. Um, but as far as storytelling is concerned, it was important, I think, to, to have that sense of the locations where the paintings were, other people talking about the paintings, and then the overall narrative, the overall driving story. And I, and I decided very early on to do it chronologically. Now, the dating is sometimes a bit of an issue, but we, we did a lot of research and again with Martin and one or two others, and we've kind of positioned them as best we can. Um, and what you then get, one of the storylines is you just get this sense of this young man 
who is talented and works in a workshop, Verrocchio's workshop, and Verrocchio's a very interesting artist. Yes, he is. Then he becomes this kind of solo artist, doing other things, of course, but including painting. Then he has his own workshop. And so sometimes he might, and, and this is, I'm doing Raphael at the moment. Raphael had an even bigger workshop. So, so maybe the face is done by Leonardo, but the background's done by a very talented colleague. Um, and, and of course, the other great thing about making a film like this is you're constantly learning. And again, by meeting the directors or the curators, it's also a way of interrogating them about the paintings, asking them, what is it about this painting that's, that's so interesting to you, or why is it so? I mean, the director of the Hermitage, he may just have been saying this to me, but he said, you know, they, they, that is an extraordinary place. It has so much. You can turn did, a corner. And... Did you have a few years ago, a number of, I don't remember how many years ago, but we screened a film called The Russian Ark. Did I know. You... Yeah. yeah. And yeah. That, was, that was a trip through time, going just using the Hermitage as the vessel. And yeah. One take. Great place, yeah. Yeah, it's an, it's an extraordinary place. You turn a corner and there's you know, Michelangelo's Crouching Boy, or you, anyway, lots. We, we, we had a film which was supposed to come out this Easter, but it's been delayed till next Easter, called Easter in Art. And it's a really, really good film because it, it again, I've, I've, I've gone to the four main gospels, taken, uh, it, um, constructed the narrative of what actually happens in those last seven days, which most people don't really know what the gospels say, and then shown how artists through the ages have depicted it and why. All the greats, you name an artist, they have, this is the most painted story in history for lots of reasons. But we did four or five, well, maybe even more paintings that, you know, that were in the Hermitage. Um, but what the director said to me was, you know, this, this, these two Leonardos, one of them in particular, is the most popular painting, the most visited artwork in this gallery it's just, you know something about leonardo just connects with the people um, and in a sense my job was to kind of show you these paintings and in a cinema environment try to create that connection and you do that in the way that you film it the way that you edit it the soundtrack is very important um, I, I wanted to ask you about that your your choice of music um, among the things that I that I learned personally I mean, knew he was architecture engineering all the things that this Renaissance man could have drafted and botany anatomy geology obviously painting and sculpture but I wasn't really aware that he was such a good musician that the other musicians who were professional musicians resented him <laughs> so music obviously and makes sense because math and music have always have always been uh, yeah. sort of companions. Um, when you chose the mu were you the one who chose the music or, and how did you, there was so much and such beautifully complimentary, they fit so well to the narrative and to the paintings. As I said a minute ago, we've just finished a film about Frida Kahlo, which is our 25th. Congratulations, that's great. Uh, exhibition on screen and each one, the score, in, in each of those films, the score is very important. You know, when you go to a gallery, 99.9% .9 of the time, there's no music. One or two galleries I've been to have a soundtrack, but very few. But basically, in a sense, you're, you're what, looking at the painting um, in the absence of music. There'll be sound. That's not to say there's no music within the paintings. We did a film about Vermeer, which made quite a lot of the fact that 12 of its 35, 36 paintings included musical instruments. And he does that for a reason. People, in a sense, would be hearing the music of that instrument while they're looking at the painting. Some of the Impressionist paintings are, in a sense, um, musical in their construction. They might have vertical trees, which is like a rhythm going across them. Anyway. No, no, I, I don't. Bosch is really interesting. Bosch, we had some beautiful polyphonic music of the period to go with, with, with this again 500 years ago and we interviewed the director of this polyphonic choir who said that there's a very strong 
argument and, and we, we filmed him in, in the very chapel that Bosch used to go to to listen to this type of music and he said look the, the, the multi narratives that are going on in polyphonic music is is replicated in the way that Bosch himself painted you have all these different stories happening when I started with Leonardo, one of the first things somebody said to me was, um, there's very little music of that period. And I thought that can't be true. So, oh, actually I have to go back a stage. Uh, what I was going to say was that every time we start a film, we think, what is, what is the ideal score? Is it something contemporary? Now what's very popular in documentaries broadly is Philip Glass, that type of, you don't really hear it. It's kind of repetitive. But it's there, it's, it's, it's in a sense, it's doing, doing a number of things. It's excluding other sounds. It's kind of making you less aware of people eating popcorn or they're breathing <laughs> three, three seats down. It's also helping the edit, fit, physically helping the edit work. You, you're cutting. And if there's no music, you're much more aware of shots changing. Music really helps that That's progress. True. Yeah. It's also giving a tonality to things. Um, and that's really important. So you have to choose quite carefully. Now, some of our films, we've, we did one called Painting the Modern Garden, Monet to Matisse, and we had quite a big score, you know, strings, and because it was all about the garden and how artists painted the garden. Other times we try to find period music that evoke a sense of time. And that's what we did here. Now, again, I was lucky because, because it was the 500th anniversary, there was one group in particular who had gone back and they'd done the research and then they created a CD of some of the music of the time. And there's four or five pieces in the film that come from them. That was great. We allowed ourselves a kind of a 50 year window. So few, some small decades before and after Leonardo's own life. Um, and then there are some paintings where even now, I mean, the, the Salvatore Mundi, uh, I, mean, I, I, I hear people crying when they see that painting. It's so powerful. And the choice of music was really appropriate. I mean, it just connects. Amazing. We, we do also have, a, have two uh, composers. And um, that, that, so the Raphael is being composed. The Michelangelo was a composed score. Um, uh, and the other thing I'll say is it's also important to work on the score very early because when you have this music in your head, when you're doing your research, when you're filming, when you're editing, it, again, it just gives you that sense of, of how, the, you know, the pace. What I'm trying to do with Exhibition on the Screen is, is hold paintings up there for longer, certainly longer than you would ever get on television, you would normally get on television. Um, and again, the choice of music allows you to hold something that little bit longer. I have to tell you how much I truly, thoroughly enjoyed where the camera begins and it's such a loving close up and it pans up and you get to see the brush stroke and, and, and the fiber of the canvas or the wood. It's just absolutely, it's almost erotic. It's absolutely wonderful. Well, that's, I have to say that's another part of it, which is that I, I, there was no pretense with Leonardo of me trying to find something to criticize. This was a, a, um, an exercise in saying, just, t just pause for a minute and look at what a human being like us 500 years ago was capable of. And just think about that. Um, I also found, find it a very, whatever one's religious beliefs, I think it's also a very spiritual film. And I found that as I was progressing through the film, and again, I, I see that even in Eastern art, one of our marketing comments is that whether you're religious or not, there's an, you know, there's an enormous amount of spirituality in these paintings. The, the relationship between mother and child, the mother that knows her child is going to die on the cross. Um, relationships between um, you know, different individuals, crowds, the suffering of a human being. I mean, part of this, of course, was it was an excuse for painters to really go to town. They would, you know, they were used to doing portraits, and here they could do a man dying on a cross, 
and boy, some of them really, you know, Rembrandts and the others, I mean, um, very, very powerful. And Leonardo was, was of that too. And of course, the other thing you, you have with Leonardo is that his story is so extraordinary. For him, painting is, is the, it's almost the bottom of his list. Right. In sculpture, he's, I'm, I'm reading a book at the moment. He took it for granted, it was like breathing. It was, yeah. I'm reading a book this morning. I, I read a chapter of a book by Bill Bryson called The Body. Just by coincidence, Bill Bryson makes reference to, he's talking about um, uh, uh, blood, and he makes reference to, um, in fact, it's in the book, there's a drawing by Leonardo of, of, of course blood. There. I mean, it's amazing. <laughs> I mean, I, I do make my films to have some kind of longevity, but I'm thinking, what, maybe 50 years? Maybe, maybe 20? And these are paintings that, you know, it's 500 years ago. Um, I must say, as an aside, making a film about Raphael and realizing that he was looking back 1500 years to the sculptures of the ancient Romans. Uh, again, it makes you realize that great art, as long as we don't destroy it, um, there's no reason why it's not relevant for millennia. Agreed. Um, question. There was so much amazing and wonderful shots and conversations and, and part of the narrative. In the editing process, how, how do you come to what you're keeping and what you're, what you're cutting? Um, this was an unusual film for us because it's longer than normal, which partially answers that question. Um, I've made four films about composers, Mozart, Beethoven, Haydn, and Chopin. Good and choice. Of the, of the 200, 250 films that I've made, they're four of my favorites. Definitely, I absolutely love making them. They're about one hour and 45 to two hours 15 long. I never had a complaint from anybody that they were too long. In fact, people always said, oh, I wish they'd gone on. I think that our films are, are different. And when we, the first exhibition on screens, it kind of trick, tickled into 92 minutes, 93 minutes. And I just felt that people were getting a little bit fidgety. And I, I could talk about why that is, but basically we, I decided that these films should be about 85 minutes long. Leonardo, that's just impossible. If you set yourself the target, of including all his paintings, um, it was just too much. And in fact, the film was, and the film is about one hour 45, I think. The film was at 1.2 hours long. And there were, there were two paintings that I, I did decide to cut. Now these, these are paintings, I mean, famously there were three Leonardo paintings that had disappeared. <coughs> Excuse me. One of them, Salvatore Mundi, reappeared. The other two, um, there are very good copies of uh, uh, the Battle of, of Anghiari. Oh, right. It disappeared, but there was a copy made of it or part of it. And then later in the Swan also disappeared, but there was a very good copy made of it. So we actually went, you know, we, we, we talked about the copies. But in the end, I thought actually that can be a DVD extra. I, I took, those two had to come out. So I couldn't get it down anything below 145. <clears throat> My editor and I did look at it and thought, well, can we speed it up a bit? We thought, you know what? You know, I, I don't think people are gonna get frustrated by this. The, the paintings are just too powerful. Um, so true. So there were parts of the biography, therefore, that were left out. Um, we could have talked more. I mean, we include the drawings and the Drawings are extraordinary. It, it, drawings are somewhat sometimes overlooked with artists. When we did the Bosch film, his drawings really struck me as they're just extraordinary. Raphael drawings that you could do easily two hours on just the drawings of Leonardo. We do a few minutes. Um, we could have done a bit more of biography. There's enough biography, but we could have done more. Um, so yes, yeah, certain things, certain things get pushed to the wayside a little bit. But if, if you come away from this film, 
encouraged to go and do your own research, do your own reading, great. You know, I can't include everything in the film. Like with Mozart and Beethoven, I couldn't include all the music. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, so the thing about yeah. drawing, the thing about drawing, there was an exhibit, two exhibits in New York recently. One of them was at the Morgan Library, and it was just drawings. And yeah. uh, and I've always personally loved to to see drawings because to me it's the most immediate connection between the brain and the page, and because the ideas are being played out almost before your eyes. The other one was a, a, an exhibit that was called Un, Unfinished, and it was at the Met Breuer, the museum, okay, in Madison. And it was famous, um, and not so famous, uh, paintings uh, and artworks that hadn't been finished. And one was by Van Gogh just before he killed himself, mm. um, and so on. So you saw the rest of the piece and you saw just the unfinished piece and you yeah. learned more about him, I think, from yeah. the unfinished piece. So that, those, it was good to include them and yeah. just selfishly, I would have <coughs> loved to see, have seen more. Okay, <laughs> that's, that, that, that's on the DVD then. Okay, it, great, I'm in. The, the, um, I mean, when is an artwork finished is of course a very interesting question. But the uh, very big decision. My Very professor good. always said, the most important decision you have to make is when to say, cut, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> even as a filmmaker. I once asked Michael Palin this, I said, when, do you, when is something finished for you? And he said, we, Monty Python, we always went to, we always went too far. <laughs> and it was always finished a bit earlier than when we actually finished it, he felt. Um, I think, I mean, I made a film about Cezanne, one of our most popular films. In there, there's a portrait where the, the poor sitter sat, I think I remember correctly, 137 times. I mean, just, oh, and terrible. in the finished painting, which Cezanne almost destroyed, but the sitter said, no way, I'm keeping this, you're not. <laughs> but in the finished painting, there's two, knuck two knuckles, which is still the color of the canvas. And the sitter talks about the fact that Cezanne was staring and staring and staring, said, I'm going to the Louvre. I need to go and find in some of the, some of, somebody else's painting the exact tonality, color tonality that I need for those two knuckles. He obviously didn't, never did it because they're still unfinished. I mean, it's a fantastic story. It is a great story. When you look at this painting, like so much as Cezanne, I mean, it's so it's such an extraordinary texture of colors. And they have these two white, not well, you know, canvas white knuckles. Um, I mean, of course, famously Leonardo, and Raphael is a bit guilty of this, but famously Leonardo had trouble finishing things because he must have worked extremely slowly. He was constantly being given uh, other tasks. And one thing that's always very important to remember with a Mozart, with a Monet, with a Cezanne, with a Leonardo, they are always working for money. It is absolutely a myth to imagine that Mozart writes for fun. Never writes for fun. The nearest he gets really is if he goes out and Beethoven did more of this and they, they go, he's in the pub, bar, and they're just improvising. He's, he's having a piano competition where they just improvise off each other. That's fun. But when he writes a piano concerto, a symphony, a duet of some sort, he's doing it because he's been commissioned or he, he's hired a concert hall and he has got new pieces. Same thing with Leonardo. They, you know, obviously the drawings are interesting because that's him doing it for himself, but the paintings are always commissioned works and then he'll get a better offer. And if the Pope says, come to Rome, you, you, go. you, you have to go, even stuff's unfinished. And then, then you, and of course, the other thing that happens with Leonardo, you see this um, with uh, um, Virgin of the Rocks, the first version. Again, they were given quite strict parameters. We want this painting, it's got to be this size, it's going into a particular place in a church, or <clears throat> and we want it to we want it to be about Saint Matthew, we want it to be about Saint Cecilia. And so and there were traditional ways of showing these individuals and the relationship between them and Jesus and Joseph and Mary. The colours, you know, there was tradition. And Leonardo would be like, hmm, I think I'm gonna do it differently. <laughs> so sometimes you can imagine the shock that these people who paid a lot of money, they probably waited three years, 
they've got a big gap in their church waiting for this painting and then it turns up and it's got a different perspective and Mary's shown as you know a young girl off the street or whatever um, so sometimes works were rejected and he was told no we don't want that go and do it again um, so there's all sorts of things going on why he doesn't finish I don't I don't think that he was sometimes you feel people being a bit pejorative you know he was too lazy to finish he couldn't be bothered to finish I don't think it was like that I think he was just you know he'd been he'd gone and dissected some somebody in, in the morgue and then he'd been thinking about how is he going to build this how's he going to do this statue of bronze and then he'd done a bit of painting and he was just doing so much he was extraordinary extraordinary human being extraordinary mind just yeah. just um, Giorgio Vasari and, and his book. I don't know that everybody out there, um, because there's, there are several quotes that talk about his, uh, and I know he spoke about many other artists because it was part of my education, but um, what, what is the, the prevailing thought about Giorgio Vasari? Um, as I mentioned briefly, the first place you should start as a, as a filmmaker of biographies is letters, correspondence. So when you make a film about Beethoven, the first thing you do is you read all the letters and then you immediately get a different perspective on who he is to the prevailing view of him being miserable, misogynist. Actually within the letters, you, you see that he was funny and loving and loyal and lots of other things besides. I made a film for exhibition on screen, which was just the letters of Monet. There are 3,000, more than 3,000 letters have survived. You read through those and you learn an enormous amount about Monet. Um, and I, I'm sure there are, um, anyway, when there's, when there's an artist that has no correspondence or very little, like Vermeer, like Bosch, it's, it's a little bit harder. Um, there is, of course, correspondence with Leonardo, so that helps, but it's not, there's not as much as obviously you would like. Sorry, remind me of your question. I've gone off. Giorgio Vasari. How, Giorgio how Vasari. Is... So, when you have somebody who is writing only a few years later and knew some of the artists that he writes about, had seen the paintings, knew the period, knew some of the people that commissioned it, that's a really valuable primary resource. But you have to be careful because, uh, you know, this, 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 he's writing at, at an age, in fact, this age went on until very relatively recently where you can only travel as fast as a horse can run. Um, you can't be everywhere. Uh, you can't know everything. Um, painters, artists didn't name their paintings. They didn't date their paintings mythology was everything people but artists were selling themselves and exaggerating paintings disappeared into private collections where you couldn't see them so you've got to be cautious and actually i i i it cost me in this film it's interesting that you mentioned vasari because i made a really stupid mistake because i know to check the validity of every single quote and i don't know what i did and it was it cost me money because at the end of the original film, I quoted Vasari saying um, he died in the arms of, of, of the, the French, king. King, of the French right. king at the age of such and such. And we released the film in the United Kingdom first of all. And I had one screening, a premiere screening with Martin where neither he nor I noticed what happened and then there was another screening that Martin attended and I wasn't there but he did another Q&A on my behalf and he sent me a note saying um, you know you know that Vasari gets the date wrong the age wrong oh, <laughs> that was a terrible moment because we had to go back in and change the film which cost money but Vasari had and it was it's, it's, it's the easiest thing to check because we know when he was born and we know when he, di when he dies so we know the age if the sari gets it wrong, all of which is to say, um, it, it, you know, you've got to be cautious with, with first-hand accounts. But the sari is is definitely where you you look. I, I'm just behind behind the computer, um, my laptop. I have the sari because I'm looking at him for Raphael. But again, you know, he, he talks about the fact that Raphael was a student of. 
Perugino in Perugia. Actually, the current thinking is that he wasn't um, that, that he went to Perugia and he saw Perugino's work and he was impressed by it and they might have worked together, but he wasn't a student of. So, a very useful resource. Yeah. Thoroughly recommend people read it. There's plenty of artists that he talks about. He's the nearest that we have to a kind of first hand account of some of these uh, Michelangelo, Raphael, Leonardo, three extraordinary human beings. Um, but one has to take into account that, the, that, that he, he, the, there may be some mistakes in there or misinterpretations, which, which is what keeps scholarship so fresh because people are always, I'm going sure. off, you know, I'm interviewing someone soon about Raphael who's, you know, finding out new things about his youth that are just coming to light 500 years later. And it's amazing. Amazing. Before, before we wind this in, and I could actually speak to you much longer. So <laughs> I, will, I will be kind to you and ask you to just give me some final thoughts on your, your favorite moment in, sh in making this film. Because we've heard about the difficulties, now let's hear about your favorite moment. I, well, one moment that comes to mind, I actually, for various reasons, the first time I saw it, I, there, there was an exclusive preview um, in a very nice cinema in Washington, D.C. called The Avalon. Yes. I was actually there doing a screening of a, of a film about Degas at the National Gallery of Art. And I contacted the Avalon where we screened and said, do you want to have the first screening of Leonardo? Of course, they said yes. And that was a, that was a Saturday morning. Cinema was packed. And I just felt, I could just feel the engagement of the audience. And then when the Sabaton Mundi came up, it, it is so powerful. Oh, so much so. It, it, to the, by the way, it almost doesn't matter who painted it because it is such an extraordinary painting. But I, 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 I that's, a whole, that's a whole other conversation. <laughs> that's a whole other conversation. Right. But it is, it is, and again, whether you believe in Christianity or not, it, it kind of doesn't matter either. This is a very powerful human being looking at you. Um, in the actual filming, oh, I mean, it was, it's a struggle. It's like, you know, I'm organizing to go and shoot in Italy. And as you can imagine right now, there's all sorts of complications. Every day, there are so many emails going backwards and forwards about car hire, about access, dealing with the Vatican is very difficult. Of course, when you get to film, and sometimes in your own preparation, you don't think enough about the mo that at some moment you will be standing in front of this painting. And when you have a camera, it's fantastic because you suddenly, Everything else is excluded and you're just looking at details. And I must say, when I got to the Uffizi, I've been to the Uffizi obviously before, but they have a, I don't know if I'd seen the room before, they have a new room, newish room with the three Leonardos, which you see in the film. Kind of presented in a, in a slightly new, modern way, the kind of, the, not really framed, the sort of the wall, anyway, it's kind of almost, built into the walls. And if you then just stop for a second and actually look, and that's ultimately to, I mean, what, what exhibition on screen is trying to encourage people to do is to just pause, you know, turn these off and look, and look at the storytelling, look at the detail, look at the craft, but also just think, how on earth do you do that? Um, or, or just be, moved by the fact the reason these are great artists is because they're communicating human values that are consistent. Um, there, there were, there are, clearly there are other moments too, but I, I think standing in the Uffizi when it was shut I know. and looking at those, looking at those, wow. um, there was another moment which is slightly different, but it was also kind of noticeable and salutary. It was in, in St. Petersburg, in the Hermitage. So we had arranged to film on a Monday when it shut. And just the way the, the, the paintings are facing windows and the windows can't be completely closed so or the curtains aren't strong enough to keep out all the light. So we had to have big black drapes up. It was all a bit complicated. 
five times there was a tour, private tour group came through. They'd obviously uh, either off a cruise or an art tour. Oh, God. They, they'd obviously paid money <coughs> to get in when the gallery was shut. And five times, and as these groups were coming up, I thought, okay, well, let's just pause. Let, you know, they've come to look at these two Leonardos. Let, we, we can wait five minutes. But I stood and watched them all. And I can tell you that not one person really looked at those paintings. Most of them, and bear in mind of who they are, they're maybe on a, an art cruise or their art, most of them went and walked on. Not one of them really, not one of them really stopped and, and really looked at the painting. Maybe they, to be fair, maybe they felt, I mean, we were just standing at the back. Maybe they felt some pressure knowing that we were waiting, but I think that it's a, it's a lesson for these big galleries in a way. And, that, and perhaps one way they can navigate COVID is to say, don't try to look at everything. It's too much. Just focus on like five objects. And maybe in an ideal world, and maybe the galleries could help, but just do a little bit of research before you go. You know, just choose five, it could be like Met. Uh, choose something from a wing you've never been into before. Right. Or, you know, it could be furniture, it could be tapestries. And you think, oh, and do five minutes of Google, but at least get a sense and then go and find it. That's quite exciting. Find the piece and then really look at it and think, how on earth do you do that? It's almost better than just kind of wandering through, trying to absorb. And in, unfortunately, it, it's unfortunate, but many people just want to be able to say that they were there, and well, that's it. Well, it's I, it, this is something that comes up where, um, you know, we we're always trying to encourage more and more people, obviously, to come and see our films in the cinema. And clearly, galleries have huge numbers going through them and exhibitions have huge numbers, five, six, seven hundred thousand. <coughs> of course, part of it is that it is an, it's an easy, let's go to the gallery. Um, and in fact, it's interesting in, in some Middle Eastern countries, you know, the shopping mall and now a little bit the gallery is somewhere that people can, can go in mixed groups where you can see people of the opposite sex as a younger generation. Oh, wow. Um, but people will, you know, obviously will go on dates to the, and it is, you know, if you're in New York, it's, it is quite nice just to wander through the Met. But I think, you know, don't, don't, don't treat it as wallpaper. And for, for example, for me with Eastern art, I didn't really, I didn't really know the stories and it was quite difficult to understand. And it wasn't, they, they weren't, the, they're not, the wings that I would normally go to. I might go to Dutch art or the Impressionist. Or... But actually part of the reason to do the film was that I wanted to make myself look more carefully at the most popular story in art history. And what a reward. You know, every great artist has dealt with it. And, you know, Rubens, who I'm not that fond of generally, but I mean, Rubens and Caravaggio, I might go. I mean, um, Caravaggio is a whole other story. <laughs> whole other story. He, he's on our list. He's on our list for <laughs> good, good, two years. In fact, we're, we're, doing Carav we're doing the same thing. We're doing Caravaggio the works. I mean, but the, the problem is we can't do a four hour film. So it's going to have to be the works selected. <laughs> oh, yes. But what a life. Yeah. Yes. Oh, amazing. He, I mean, he's, when I've been asked in the past who's my favorite artist, right now I've, probably defer to Leonardo, but I have said Caravaggio in the past. Again, because of that storytelling, this is pre-cinema, and on this canvas, it's just a blank canvas, isn't it? With, with pigment and oil and a brush, you create this three-dimensional story with all sorts of narrative. A whole opera, yes. Yeah, a whole opera. Yes. Fantastic. And the, I have to say, Raphael, uh, we, we've, we've filmed already, it's the biggest exhibition that's ever been. It's, it's currently in Rome. And uh, it's, it, 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 it is jaw dropping. And, you, and, and again, it's not, it's 200 artworks, not, I think it's 100 and, 140 of them are by him. Impressive. 
and he dies age 37 and he's and again this is at a time when you think of all the modern conveniences they didn't have all the time saving things devices you know they had to go and talk to people they had to go who knows where to go to the toilet they had to go out to eat and yet despite all of that they create these artworks i mean the madonnas it's easy to think oh madonnas i've seen you just have to stop and look and what the craft is just exquisite spectacular well phil we have come to the end of, our, <laughs> of this conversation but i'm so so happy that we'll be able to share this conversation with the people who are going to be watching the film and obviously sharing their reaction to the film with their friends. And I hope that it's a tidal wave because mm. everyone should see this film. And, if, and people who don't know what a rock star Leonardo was, I think it's time for them to learn. Well, just to say that if people want more information, they go to the exhibitiononscreen.com website. There's clips from the other films, there's behind the scenes videos, there's interviews with like the composer or the editor of various films. We're very uh, um, active on Facebook with lots of art world stories, Instagram, mm -hmm. um, and people can communicate to us. So if somebody sees Leonardo and they've got a question or they've got a comment, um, they go onto the exhibition on screen Facebook site and just we, we, we'll respond. It might not be me, but we'll respond. Wonderful. Um, and then coming up, just so you know, well, we've had to delay the Frida Kahlo film, so that will be coming out in the fall, then the Raphael, then the Cezanne repeat encore screening, Easter in Art next Easter, and then uh, next June will be a film about the sunflowers, Van Gogh's sunflowers, <coughs> excuse me, which is a really interesting film. Um, so plenty, plenty to see. It, look uh, forward to the Gold Lots Coast Art Cinema. And we will, we will post that when we post this interview. We will have uh, where people can uh, log on to, to connect with you because we think this is an important conversation for them to have. Great. Uh, and thank you again. It was an absolute joy. My pleasure too. Hope to see you next year, maybe. Who knows? I tell you, come visit. We're very happy okay. to take you around. <laughs> All right. Stay well. And you too. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.